Hello everyone and welcome. Sit back, relax, make a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink and get ready for new stories from Yellow Cat. Send your own favorite stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. So subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet. Let's get started. Have you ever stood up in the middle of a work shift and left your job? Why if so? Part 6. I worked in the graveyard at Tim Hortons from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. for about seven years, more than 10 years ago. Someone who had been fired five times for not showing up was hired again and put on graveyards. Most shifts had no more than two or three people. I had a meeting with him planned for Sunday night or Monday morning. Early in the morning, I had to take care of two big orders of donuts and a freezer and cooler truck delivery. I told him if he doesn't show up, I'm going to show myself out. It was clear that he didn't call or show up. I was by myself, and when I called managers, they told me to deal with it. I worked as hard as I could for a few hours, but it was hard to do everything I needed to do for the big order, plus all the customer stuff. As I put the strudels aside, I thought about how I wouldn't be able to take any breaks because I would have to put away the freezer delivery while finishing the donut orders and work in the drive through as it gets busier at 5 a.m. And I would be told over and over again, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, and I would be making just a little more than minimum wage. Then I remembered that this job was only meant to be temporary for a few years. It would have to do with computers. Programming would have been ideal, but even some repair work would have been fine. That being said, I was always too tired to care. That's what I have to do if I quit. I made up my mind, turned off everything, and left. I've had a job as a software developer for 10 years. Five years ago, I worked at a trucking company. I had to go into a storage container where bills of lading for all shipments over the past five years were kept by a new manager. You only have to keep it for five years. They asked me to find a certain shipment. There are a lot of boxes, some marked and some not. Most likely 500,000 pages of paper, if not more. This was back before everything was saved on hard drives. My boss scolded me about it for a week. Also, there was a new rule that said I had to get old customer signatures on packages I received. It would have been up to the driver delivering the packages to get a signature from the customer. I looked for this shipment for half of the day and faxed receipts to old customers to get them to sign them. There was no way to get old customers to respond since they had no reason to. They already have their packages and it's up to the drivers to get signatures. The boss called me into his office while I was on my way to lunch. I need to know how long before you find that shipping document and how many signatures you've obtained because it's been a week. I talked about everything I laid out and the problems. He stated, well, go ahead and go to lunch and we're having a talk when you get back. I felt like I was going to have a panic attack at lunch, so I sat in the car and thought about what I could do. My bank account had enough money to pay my bills for three months. I wasn't pleased there for a while. I'd been there for too long, and it was just a job. And it turned into a dangerous place for me. It was such a pointless job and place to be. I'm wasting my time looking for useless paper records and dealing with bad management. While I was sitting in a Sonic parking lot, I called Human Resources on my cell phone. I wish I could say I stormed into the office and smacked the manager in the face. I told them I wasn't happy for them and that I would be leaving right away and not coming back. I wish them the best and thanked them for the chance. I did get a call from the manager, but ignored it and moved on. So I've always lived below my means so I can quit my job on the spot. Learn to always put my mental health first. Dishwasher at a pizza place owned by people in the area. It was my last job in a kitchen before I went to work in an office. I was making the Ohio minimum wage, which was $7.25 an hour, something very low. I don't remember the exact date, but it was around seven, eight years ago. I didn't feel well that day, but I needed the money, and the way we kept track of time was with an old-fashioned paper card that you punched in and out. Not long after they started, I found out that they were actually taking my wages for no reason. At the time, I was always five minutes late to the job I hate, but it wasn't until 15 minutes into the shift that I learned she wasn't paying anyone. Guess that's just how they did things. As it turned out, my hours got longer and my paychecks got much smaller. It wasn't hard to do the math because I was paid every week and the difference was clear. 
I let their kitchen get so messy that they almost didn't have any dishes to do. I left work, washed my hands, and left. Got some rest when I got home. They wouldn't pay me for the last week I worked after this. <laughs> I kept asking for meetings and setting times for them so that we could figure out why my checks were consistently short even though I had worked more hours. They avoided me for a few months, and now it's time for W-2. This was a lot of work, and it took them two to three months to give me my W-2. They stole my money. I was really mad and wanted to know how I could get it back and also report them for theft. I found out who to talk to and what to do, set up a meeting with them, secretly recorded the whole 8-12 to 12 minute conversation, and then told them they were lying. I wrote a pretty long letter note on the back of my form and called the Ohio Division of Commerce. I faxed it in and got a response the next day instead of having to wait two weeks, which was a pain. Of course, about six months later, I got a huge check. I went to the ODOC that same day and made about 120 copies of the complaint form. I put some on their front desk, some on the windshield of every employee car, and some in their mailbox. The other workers there are a bunch of washed-up has-beens. As far as I know, no one else filed a complaint, but they were really mad at me. <laughs> There's always a right way to respond, and I have to say I did pretty well considering I was an emotionally damaged early 20-something at the time. Yes, I've done it before. Once as a dishwasher and once as a pizza delivery driver. When I was working in a cafeteria, they told me they would put me in charge of cashiers, but instead put me in charge of serving food. I hate being lied to like that. It was about 20 minutes before I quit. I was working as an estimator at a construction company in June 2022. My boss was a mean, narcissistic jerk who loved yelling at me over small things until I cried. It's impossible for me not to cry when I'm mad. Some people on the crew told me I was wrong about the square footage of a building one day. I showed him every piece of proof I had that it was right, but it didn't matter because his wise mason told me I was wrong. While he was calling, three other people in the room could hear him scream at me. He was so loud that they understood every word, even though the phone wasn't on speaker. He told me to put up an ad for my job and that he would pay me $15 an hour if he could prove I was wrong. It became clear to me at that point, with no doubt in my mind, he would find a way to blame it on me even if he went to the site and did a takeoff that looked just like mine. I would still be held responsible. On top of that, flipping burgers would earn me $15 an hour. I called my husband and asked for his okay. Then I got up, put everything I owned in a trash bag, hugged my co-workers and left. Didn't look back. Over the next few months, he begged me to come back, offered to train someone else, and gave me the chance to get my job back. Not only he, but his wife and his beloved Mason called me to tell me I was ruining his business and I needed to do the right thing and come back long enough to find someone else. I told his wife that I wouldn't go back because the number wasn't high enough. Since then, I haven't heard from them. I'll always be thankful that I had the guts to quit, even though I was scared of being out of work. The best thing I've ever done. Tell me about an HOA or neighbor who's been a nightmare for you, part six. Several years ago, my mother-in-law was battling ovarian cancer at the stage four designation. Our Christmas lights were not something we wanted to take down. Despite the fact that we were very touch and go, we were constantly going to the hospital. Had a child who was younger than one. It was a very emotional period of time. Our home was visited by the HOA compliance officer on a regular basis, and they did so at all hours of the day. Considering that we had surveillance cameras, we finally decided to call the guard shack to inquire about the nature of the emergency after reviewing the footage. It was communicated to us that Christmas had been over for three weeks and that we are required to turn off our lights before the end of the month. If we fail to do so, he will impose a fine of $25 per day for the first week and then $50 per day after that. When we explained the situation to him, he responded by saying, well, it's not my problem, you should turn off your lights. The D-bag was the target of my wife's rage. Went to the next board meeting and let loose on the board and general manager. Didn't turn out to be a policy of the HOA. The individual was employed by the security company that was contracted to work the main gate entrance guard shack. 
He was eligible for a bonus if he patrolled the area and issued fines for violation of the homeowners association. This jerk would just drive around and make up his own rules and fines and by the time the next meeting rolled around he was fired. When the contract with the security company expired in the summer, a new security company could be hired. In the end, everything turned out perfectly. D fired and my mother-in-law has been cancer free for more than a year. She tore down the fence we built. After that, she tore up a 1,000 golden bill, about 450 euros, in front of us to show that she wasn't poor. Many of the pieces were blown away in the wind so we couldn't put it back together. Later, she started throwing leaves over the fence because they weren't coming from her tree. Our garden was just concrete. <laughs> to protect the street tree from being cut down, she tied herself to it. At the same time, she was the one who protested and demanded a bus stop close to her on her street. When my friend and I were playing football and the ball somehow went over the fence, she yelled and ran out with a kitchen knife, stabbing the ball in a fit of rage. We were so scared that we couldn't breathe. Then my mom ran out and went back inside to get a crowbar. Then my dad ran outside, which is when we were pushed inside. The next day, she was taken away by paramedics for about a month. My dad didn't hit her, but she broke down. In the past, when she came back, things like this would happen from time to time, especially when the leaves were falling. Till this day, I have a fear of my neighbors complaining and shouting about everything, and I am always like, OMG, I hope this did not pee off my neighbors. During our 15 years there, many more things took place. She thought the whole street was hers because her dad built it. When we sold the house, we found out that she had a brother and the new owners went to him since he apparently owns the house. She was kicked out. My best friend S grew up in suburban Arizona. With the exception of the fact that it was generally a fascist, his family owned their home and had very few issues with their homeowners association. The beginning of everything was a few cardboard boxes. At the tender age of approximately six or seven years old, S and his sister expressed a desire to construct a fort in their front yard. Their father, being the wonderful person that he was, assisted them in constructing a cardboard box fort that they could use for playing. Because they were children, they spent a couple of hours playing in the fort before moving on to other things that diverted their attention. It was not even a day later when they received phone calls and notices that were posted on the door informing them that they were required to remove the unsightly garbage from their yard or else they'd be subject to penalty fines. Although it wasn't a major issue, they did leave the family feeling a bit jaded toward the HOA. After a few years have passed, S's father makes the decision that he wants to paint the house. The majority of homeowners associations have stringent rules regarding the color and they provide you with templates to choose from. The templates, according to him, range from tan to a slightly different shade of tan. In order to paint the entire house, S's father finds a color that he likes which is more of a greenish tan and sends it to their house. Due to the fact that they painted their house in a color that was not permitted, the homeowners association has a meltdown. There's no way I'm going to repaint my entire house, according to S's father, because it's basically the same color. Therefore, the homeowners association hires a contractor to come down with a paint color tester and post notices on their door with a detailed analysis of how his color is Yucatan and does not fit the spectrum. The notices also include a warning that they'll be fined if they do not repaint by the end of the month. Instead of giving up, as his mother finds out when the next meeting is and finds out that no one votes. The same guy has been the president of the HOA for a very long time and there's some shady business going on in terms of contracting. Her campaigning consists of running and walking around the neighborhood over the course of the next few weeks. She's victorious by a big margin. HOA meeting with the highest attendance since the organization's inception. Everyone, it would appear, was also sick and tired of the BS, but they just bowed their heads in submission. Now that S's mother has been elected president, she discovers that the previous administration had been engaging in the old practice of hooking up my son-in-law by contracting his company and paying him ridiculous amounts of money to water the sandwash BS it. She quickly puts an end to all of that nonsense. 
Rather than change any rules other than a few stupid ones, it was just recently decided by the S family office that they will not enforce any of them. For years, S's mother served as president. If you want to watch the part 5, click the link here. Thank you for subscribing, the likes, and comments. We're very happy to see you all in the comments too. Thanks for support.